Hi, thanks for joining us for today's message from Calvary in Lake Havasu. Continuing in our Gifts of Christmas sermon series, today's message provides guidance on how to give yourself to God. The scripture passage we'll be studying are found in Matthew chapter 1 as well as Luke chapter 1. To follow along with the life notes, you can download them now by visiting calvaryaz.com forward slash life notes. Now, here is Pastor Chad Garrison. I invite you to take a seat and grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to, I actually want you to look at two different passages, uh, Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter 1. Uh, We're going to look at both of those. They're only about 57 pages apart, Uh, but uh, if you don't have a Bible with you or Bible app on your device, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you and uh, start off turning page 1016 and then uh, go back to page 959. You can mark them you know, and and, uh, identify both of them. We'll look at both of them. And as always, if you're in the room and you don't have a Bible and you want one, take one uh, because uh, it it is, uh, it's our gift to you. Uh, By the way, for those of our Parker campus, you don't have Bibles in the seats around you, but there's a table in the back. You can get up right now and you can go grab a Bible and you can uh, turn to the page that I just mentioned, (laughs) 1,000 something, (laughs) 1,000. 1,016, and, uh, and then you can, uh, if you need a Bible, you can take one as well. And, and so uh, for anyone at any of our campuses, if you need a Bible, please take it. It's our gift to you. If you're joining us online, then we want you to have a Bible. If you don't have one and you want one, contact us. We'll be glad to get you a Bible because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Hey, uh, just two things I want to mention before we dive into the message. First of all, Uh, Christmas is coming up, and I know Pastor Sean already mentioned the Christmas uh, services. Uh, He left one out because we do have an 11 o'clock service in Parker, and so I want you guys to be there and fill that place up with your friends. Uh, There's six options in Havasu, so uh, pick one. Uh, Saturday night, the 23rd, uh, 9.30 and 11 at McCulloch on the 24th, or 2, 3.30 and 5 at Sweetwater on the 24th, uh, and as I mentioned before, 11 o'clock in Parker. So, uh, Pick a service, bring some friends, fill it up. But the other thing is, if you are a follower of Jesus and you've never been baptized, we would love to invite you to get baptized at one of our Christmas services. I mean, I just think it's an awesome way to celebrate uh, your faith in Jesus at the day that we celebrate his birthday to declare publicly that he is your Lord and Savior. We've already got people signed up for a couple of the services, and I'm hoping that every service has someone declaring their faith in Jesus. And so if that's you, if God is nudging you, if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, then you listen to him, let us know. You can use those connect cards and say, here's the service I want to get baptized at. We would love to help you follow Jesus in that way. Now, the other thing I wanna mention is, uh, look, I just am so blessed and overwhelmed and proud of Calvary's generosity these past few weeks in so many ways. The way you've blessed the Magdaleno and Bell families, the way, I mean, it's just awesome, the way you've supported the community fundraisers, uh, just all of that. But your generosity in the backpacks and the angel tree and all of that is incredible. So I thank you for that. But I also wanna tell you about a way that you can support ministries and not spend a dime. See, in Arizona, they have this wonderful program called the uh, tax credit. And if you're paying Arizona income taxes, you can actually direct your income taxes that you owe to bless ministry organizations. Ministry organizations like uh, Calvary Christian Academy through ACSTO. And these are out in the foyer on the walls all the time, by the way, at both campuses, all campuses. So you you can just like direct your money to bless students at CCA. Or... Uh, just recently, it got approved last year, Faith and Grace, our domestic violence shelter. You can pick one of these up on your way out and you can help support that ministry toward women and children that are escaping abuse. And, uh, and it doesn't cost you a dime, but it blesses them tremendously. And you're pointing your money toward you know, Christian causes. And you can do these and you can also still support the public schools and the curriculum that those that, that need those for the trips and for the sports and things like that. It is a win, win, win for all of us. And so I just wanna encourage you to consider that. Again, if you're paying Arizona state income taxes, please be a good steward and direct some of that toward the ministries of God. So uh, it is 16 days until Christmas. Do you have your shopping finished? Oh, okay. You know. It, it, I don't know about you guys, but it seems like Christmas is so often all about the gifts. 
right? I mean, it just, it, it just kind of, the, it dominates what we're thinking about, right? Uh, we ask children, hey, what do you want for Christmas? Right? And then after Christmas, what do we ask them? What did you get for Christmas, right? I, I mean, it's just kind of, the whole theme surrounds it. Uh, you, we encourage them to write Santa or make a list. When my youngest daughter was five or six, you know, back in the analog days, uh, one of the Christmas toy catalogs came. And we said, hey, circle some things that you want for Christmas. No, she circled everything in the catalog. Like, you know, just pages and pages and pages. Anything that was girl was hers. She it was on her list. And they were like, no, that's not what we meant. Um, you have to actually choose a couple of things. Uh, and we stress over what to get for that one person that is hard to buy for. And what I'm talking about, guys, is our wives. Anyone with me? Anyone? I see those hands. I, I feel your pain. I mean, we've only been married 39 years, and I have no idea ever what to get her. Or we stress about, you know, uh, we got to spend equal amount of money and have exactly the same number of presents for every child and grandchild that we're going to give to. At least, at least Meralda does. Any, any women have that, share that pain? Okay. Oh, the compulsions are, are rampant. We have a program for that. Uh, anyway, uh, look, Christmas and gift giving are connected. And, and if you're a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus actually is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then please understand that the, this whole idea of gift giving and the story of Christmas take on a whole different meaning. And that's what we're talking about in this series about Christmas gifts. So today, I want us to look at two biblical accounts of the central people in the Christmas story. Okay, the, the biblical story of Christmas. And, and you've heard these stories before. If you grew up in church, even if you didn't grow up in church, you've probably heard reference to these stories. So, uh, uh, but I want you to see them through a, a slightly different lens. So the two stories are the ones found in Luke 1 and Matthew chapter 1. The first one, let's look at Luke chapter 1. It's, uh, as I said, page 1016. And I'm not going to read the whole story, but uh, it's the story of Mary. And the angel Gabriel comes to her and says, you know, Hail, O blessed one, the Lord's found favor with you. And she's perplexed. And the angel says, don't be afraid, which is one of those themes of Christmas. Don't be afraid, uh, for you found favor with God. And you're going to, you know, conceive and you're going to give birth to a son who's going to be called the Son of God. And she's like, uh, I don't think so, because how can this happen? I'm a virgin. And, and, and Gabriel explains to her, the, the power of God is going to overshadow you. The Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. And, and the child that you're going to give birth to is going to be called the Son of God. And, and she's like, I don't get this. But, you know, he explains your, your cousin Elizabeth is having a child in her old age because nothing is impossible with God. And, and this is what Mary says. Verse 38, I, I want, you know, if you're going to mark stuff up in your Bible, then if you're just like borrowing one, don't do that. But if you, if you like are keeping one, this is a great verse. Mary said, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Wow. Let it be to me as you have said. I am the servant of the Lord. Now, if you flip over to Matthew chapter one, you've got Joseph's story. And it's remarkably similar, but with a whole different take on it. Uh, Matthew starts off saying this is the way the birth of Jesus came to be. Uh, Joseph was betrothed to Mary, which means that she was legally committed to marriage. The contract had already been signed between the families. It was all a done deal, except they weren't living together yet. And, uh, and they were in that process. So, uh, and she was found to be with child. And Joseph, like just about any guy would do, lost it. But he's a nice guy, so he decides he's going to divorce her because he knows the baby's not his. And, and uh, so he makes that decision, and then he, has, he falls asleep, has a dream. Angel comes to him and says, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife because that which is conceived of her is of the Holy Spirit. She's going to give birth to a son. You're going to name him Jesus because he's going to save the people from their sins. And this is to fulfill what the prophet Isaiah said. You know, behold, a virgin will be a child, and you give birth, and, and you'll call him Emmanuel. That means God with us. 
And then this is how the story ends. Verse 24, when Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Those are the stories I want us to look at in terms of the gifts. First of all, Mary heard and accepted God's plan. Okay, now we know this. I mean, we know the Christmas story. I mean, Mary's a rock star in the Christmas story. But a lot of times we don't think about how much of a rock star she really is. She heard and accepted God's plan. She literally gave herself to God knowing the risks. See, I don't know about you, but when I grew up, you know, in church that had the same Bible that, that we have, uh, nobody was explaining how dangerous it was for Mary to say yes to God. I mean, nobody was. Everybody's like, Mary, Joseph, it's the, you know, it's the nativity scene. Uh, let's all, you know, sing songs and feel good. But she gave herself to God knowing the risks. And this was a dangerous, life-changing decision that she made to give herself to God. I mean, first of all, she was most likely about 15 to 18 years old. Not exactly a full-grown woman from the way we would look at it. And, and I believe that her parents would have encouraged her to reject God's plan. I mean, because that's what we would do. Right? I mean, they would have said, hey, 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 you don't want to do this. I mean, think about the things that she risked. I just want you to name them. First of all, she risked shame. I mean, Single mothers in that day and age were considered harlots. They had one job, that could be a prostitute. That's it. No other really options. She risked being ostracized from her family. I mean, her family could have said, no, we disown you, you're done, we're done with you. You know, if Joseph divorced her and her family disowned her, she's on her own. She risked death because both Joseph and her father could have had her stoned to death for adultery. All of that was on the table. And yet, here she is, a teenager, she encounters the angel, she listened to his message, and she accepted her role as Messiah's mom. I mean, she literally gave herself to God and trusted him to take care of her. And then you had Joseph. Joseph obeyed God's directive, right? Now, you think about this. Joseph gave himself to God, and while Mary risked her life, Joseph risked his reputation and his pride. Okay, we're talking about a man. So, guys, listen up. Joseph risked his reputation and his pride. I mean, first of all, he was a just man. That's what Scripture tells us, which means he was honorable, he was committed, he was obedient to God. And so he decided that instead of stoning Mary to death for adultery, he would just divorce her. What a nice guy. Yeah, he really is compared to what he could have chosen. But um, he knew that Mary was pregnant, and he knew he was not the father. So guys, what would you do? I mean, what would you think? I mean, you'd think she is unfaithful. I mean, this is kind of like Jerry Springer stuff. If you're under 40, Google it. Anyway, so, you know, this is like, you know, better than reality TV. This is all going on in a small village, in, you know, in Galilee. And, and Joseph demonstrated incredible humility because he'd already decided to divorce her, which means he'd already told some people, here's what I'm gonna do. And then, he had to eat his words. Can you imagine that? I thought you were gonna divorce the wench. Probably didn't use that nice language. And he said, well, an angel came to me. Right. <laughs> sure he did. So you're just relying about the fact the baby's not yours. See, he changed his mind and he obeyed God knowing that his reputation would take a hit. You ever done that? Have you ever like stood up publicly and gone, I'm not gonna do this or I'm gonna do this and then, and then you changed your mind and took all the verbal abuse that went with that? See, I've done it. So I, I, I uh, you know, went to college in Phoenix and then when Merle and I got married, we went to seminary in uh, Kentucky. And all my friends were like, oh, if you go to Kentucky, you're gonna end up being a youth pastor in the South. And I said multiple times, very publicly, I will never 
be a youth pastor in the South. Guess where God made me go when I graduated seminary? I mean, every door got slammed shut in Arizona. Every door got shut in the West, in the North. I was willing to go anywhere. And God's like, no, I want you to go to this place called Albany, Georgia. Deep South. And I'm like, ah. But he made it so clear, so obvious. I was like, either I'm going to disobey God or I'm going to eat my words. And I chose to eat my words. And God blessed us because of that. I thought I'd never get out of the South after that. And here I am in Lake Havasu for 31 years, so praise God. But I'm just telling you, uh, you can say whatever you want, but to change that because God tells you is not an easy thing to do. The angel spoke to Joseph and Joseph changed his course. He gave himself to God. He obeyed God's directive. He took Mary and his wife. He endured the family shame. Can you imagine the community whispers that are going on in Nazareth? Everybody knows everybody. And he allowed God to use him as the Messiah's stepfather. See, Mary accepted God's plan. Joseph obeyed God's directive. So the question I want to ask us is simply this. Will you give yourself to God? Will you give yourself to God? And I really, you know, the answer, you're in church. You're watching service online. So the easy answer is, of course we will. Of course we will. But I really want you to struggle with this. Because in a sense, if you've already confessed Jesus as Lord, you've given yourself to God. You said, Jesus, I surrender to you. Save me, please. I can't save myself. Okay. And by the way, if you haven't given yourself to Jesus, if you haven't confessed him as Lord, we want you to do that because he'll change your life. But if you're thinking about it, listen in because it gets even better. But, uh, but I'm just going to ask you, will you com- continue giving yourself to God, listening to God, accepting his plan and following his commands on a daily basis? Because, you know, if you're a follower of Jesus, you made that decision once. You said, yes, I'm going to follow Jesus. You declared it in baptism, or you're going to Christmas. And, uh, and, and so, you, you know, you made that decision. But now it's about doing it again every day, saying, okay, God, I'm yours, and I'm going to follow you. I'm going to do what you want instead of what I want. You see, the call of Jesus is to surrender more of ourselves every single day. More of our heart, more of our desires, more of our obedience, more of our time, energy, talent, resources, all of it, Jesus calls us to surrender more. And and see, the, the, the temptation is to not do that. The temptation is, is, is there all the time. By the way, uh, if you're not aware of this, if you're a follower of Jesus, then you have an adversary. His name is Satan, the devil, you know, the evil one, call him whatever you want to. But his goal is to get you to not follow Jesus. Okay, his goal is to convince you to justify not being his servant, not doing whatever he wants. And so the temptation is to acknowledge Jesus, but live our own lives. Right? I mean, Jesus is our Savior, but, you know, we're going to live our life our way. I'll live my life my way. Give, us, give a nod to Frank Sinatra. And those of you who are young can Google him, too. <laughs> you know, the, or the temptation is to include Jesus in our lives, but not let him lead our lives. In other words, Jesus can be an important part of our lives, but we don't make him the center of our lives. Or the temptation is to rely on Jesus to save our souls, but not trust Jesus to direct our lives. In other words, it's like we say, I believe in Jesus, just not quite enough to obey him. Will you give yourself to God? Because the Christmas story challenges those practices and dares us to be like Mary and Joseph. They gave themselves to God, and that's what it challenges us to do. And and by the way, this is life change at its very core. You want to know about life-changing relationship with Jesus? This is what it looks like. It's where we say every single day, God, you have me. I'm yours. Where do you want, what more do you want me to sacrifice? What more do you want me to give to you? Uh, What more do I need to surrender? But just know this. If you give yourself to God, God will bless you. God will bless your life. Look, Mary and Joseph were blessed in their obedience. Just not in ways we often equate with blessings. For the record, Mary and Joseph never got rich. Not at all. 
Mary and Joseph never got famous during their lifetime at all. In fact, Joseph didn't even live to see Jesus do any ministry. And yet God blessed them. God blessed them. See, a lot of times um, <laughs> we want God to bless us our way and God doesn't want to do that, he'll, but he will bless us. I mean, Mary and Joseph never had a life of luxury or ease, but they were blessed by God. So if you desire God's blessings in your life, wait, let's just do a little test. Do you guys desire God's blessings in your life? I mean, because the, op, you know, the other option isn't really good. You, know, you don't really want God's judgment in your life, I'm assuming. But if we want God's blessings in our life, then it increases with surrender. The more you obey God, the greater the blessings in your life. I mean, but it's, it, it's challenging. This is not easy stuff. Jesus said, if anyone's gonna come after me, which is what we, if you're a follower of Jesus, that's what you've said you wanna do, then you gotta deny yourself, take up your cross daily and come follow me. And he said, whoever's gonna save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. By the way, he ended that by saying, by the way, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and yet loses his soul? Or there's just Jesus in John 10 where he says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. He's like, look, I'm gonna bless you, but you just follow me, you gotta deny yourself. Or, you know, the apostle Paul put it this way. He said, I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. He's like, it's not about me. It's about what can I do for Jesus? And see, when you understand this, it, it makes complete sense that the more you surrender, the more blessings you get. But, you know, we don't, we don't really want that to be our motivation. Like, hey, I want to get blessed more, so I'm going I'm to do this thing. By the way, you will. If that's your motivation, that's fine. You're just going to get blessed more. But the real motive to surrender and give yourself to God is actually better than just getting blessed. It is, it, we surrender to Jesus out of gratitude. Just simply out of gratitude that Jesus entered this world, weak and poor, that he lived as a man, he worked, he taught, he healed, he suffered, he died to save us. That's reason enough to give God our lives. Just simply, Jesus, I have no hope of life eternal apart from you. You save me, I give myself to you. So if you give yourself to God, you're gonna be blessed and your life's gonna have purpose. You'll have purpose. I mean, think about it. God used Mary and Joseph's obedience to help save the world. Is that cool or what? I mean, really, seriously. I mean, at the time, they had no idea. They thought they were just going to save Israel. And then I'm sure by the time, you know, that Joseph passed away, somewhere between 12 and 30 that of Jesus' age, um, he had no idea what was going to happen. I'm sure Mary thought it was going to be much better than watching her son get crucified. Right? Expectations. They didn't have any idea how God was actually going to use them and their obedience helped save the world. But at the time, they were nobodies. I mean, they had royal lineage. They were both descended from David, from the line of David, but they weren't connected people. They weren't powerful people. They weren't influential. They weren't popular. They were, they were simply available to be obedient to God. And I don't know if you've paid attention, but much of our culture is lost in lives without purpose. I mean, suicide is epidemic. Kind of apathetic suicide is, is not even counted as suicide. And we're talking about drug overdoses where people don't even care about living anymore. I mean, it's just, it's, it's insane. And part of that is the fact that people lack a purpose. They don't have a reason. And Jesus gives people a reason. And then, then there's a whole bunch of people in our culture that are just pursuing purposes that lead to a dead end. You know, money and fame and influence and pleasure. And that great philosopher, Jim Carrey. <laughs> you guys have heard of him then. Do you know that the, the best thing this guy ever said was simply this. He goes, I wish that everyone could be rich and famous and do whatever they want so they would discover that it's not enough. And he doesn't know Jesus, but he knows what a dead end looks like. 
I wish everyone could be rich and famous and do whatever they wanted so they could realize it's not enough. Um, you know what the sad thing is? There's a lot of us that suffer and struggle because we seek meaning in all the wrong places. If you surrender to Jesus, if you embrace a life of obedience, God's going to use your life to impact the world. And I can't tell you how he's going to use your life, but I know from just from what scripture says and from experience that God has a plan for you. And if you obey God's directives, he will fill your life with purpose that is eternal in its nature. And we know this from the Christmas story, but the apostle Paul taught it too. Ephesians 2.10, he said, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. That's Ephesians 2.10, if you want to look it up, mark it in your Bible. But, but here's the thing, here's what he's saying is, God created you, and God created you and considers you his masterpiece. Next time you look in the mirror, before you think evil thoughts about what you see, I dare you just say, God thinks I'm his masterpiece. I, I just challenge you to do that every single day. It may change how you see yourself because God considers you his masterpiece and God created you for a purpose that he gives you. That's pretty amazing. Now, all of us have tasks, but all those tasks have some things in common. They're all about glorifying God. They're all about leading people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. And they're all about loving and blessing people in Jesus' name. Okay, that's the commonality. Whatever we're doing, those things should be happening. But your specific task and my specific task are not the same. Our tasks are chosen by God according to the gifts he's given us and the calling he's put on our life. And every single one of us is gonna find joy when we're doing what God created us to do. You're gonna find joy in that. So stop pursuing your purpose for your life. You know, our, our culture has all kinds of statements that they quantify as, you know, admonitions to, you know, make your life better, but they're such ignorant statements. Follow your heart. Yeah, the heart's deceitfully wicked above all else. Follow your dreams. No. Look, yeah, God, if, if they're God-given dreams and God's calling you to that, yes, but, but really what you want to do is follow Jesus. So surrender to Jesus and embrace his purpose for your life. And then, and then just, since we're talking about it this way, one final question. Are you trying to obey God or trying to justify disobedience? Are you trying to obey God or are you trying to justify disobedience? My, when I ask this question, I, I really just mean, which way is your life leaning? Because your life is leaning one way or it's leaning the other way. You're either leaning into obedience or you're leaning into disobedience. And, and here's what I know. When, when we're trying to follow Jesus and the tempter is trying to get us to not follow Jesus, we come up with all kinds of excuses that Satan likes to put on a loop in our inside of our head and our self-talk, we think it's us, but it's really the Satan that's given us things to say. And we go, oh yeah, that makes really good sense. I think I'll believe that. See, the, Satan wants to offer us excuses why we can't obey God right now. We want to obey God, but we can't do it right now. We, we see this in the story in the Garden of Eden where, you know, Adam and Eve are there and Satan, this is before sin was in the world. And Satan's like, did God really say that? Are you really gonna die if you eat that? See, he wants you to doubt. So, you know, one of the excuses that he gives us is we're too busy. We can't surrender to God right now. We'll do that when life slows down. It's a season we're in. We'll do it later. You know, we'll start the new year off right. We'll do it then. Or one of the excuses Satan offers is we can't afford to surrender to God. I mean, we'll really surrender after we've paid off our student loans or built up our business or paid off our house or retired or finished our self-indulgent bucket list. It just costs too much to surrender right now. Or maybe Satan is convinced you that it's just unrealistic. 
I mean, come on. It's unrealistic to surrender to Jesus. I can't run my business God's way. In my job, I can't treat people like Jesus wants me to treat people. My coworkers wouldn't understand. Nobody, really, nobody really expects us to serve like that or forgive like that or love our enemies or tithe. Do they really? Or maybe the excuse is, hey, if I surrendered to Jesus, if I really gave God myself, then it would wreck my family. I mean, my husband or my wife wouldn't join me in it and it'd ruin our marriage. My kids would rebel. My family would ostracize me. My grandmother would be disappointed. I can't do it for my family. Satan tries the excuses on all of us, every single one of us. So in your heart, Do you want to obey God or are you trying to excuse your disobedience? Here's what I know. God loves you. God forgives you. God saves you. And God wants to bless you. And today God is calling you to surrender, to give yourself to him. So I just want to encourage you to say yes, to listen and to follow Jesus. And this Christmas, out of all the presents that you give, give yourself to Jesus. Let's pray. Father, that you want us is a miracle. We are rebellious. We are defiant. We are self-destructive creatures, and you know all of that, and yet you still love us. And your grace abounds to us, and, and you paid for our sins through the blood of Jesus, through his sacrifice, through his death and resurrection. We are forgiven of all the evil that we've done or ever will do. And that truth is so amazing. And God, we don't have to give ourselves to you so that you will forgive us. We give ourselves to you because you have forgiven us. And we wanna live for you and we wanna point people to you and we want your power to rest in us and we want to, to literally stop making excuses and just make room for you to rule and reign in our heart. So right now, God, uh, I surrender. I want to surrender for all of us, but I can't do that. But I know you can have me. And I pray, Lord, that everyone in this room, everyone joining us online, everyone at all of our campuses would say, yes, God, have me this Christmas. That's my prayer. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Mary heard and accepted God's plan, and Joseph obeyed God's directive. The question is, will you give yourself to God and follow His purpose for your life? I hope so. If today's message left you with questions, I invite you to email us at questions at calvaryaz.com. We'd love to engage with you, answer your questions, and pray with you. You can also connect with us by filling out a Connect card. Those are available at calvaryaz.com forward slash connect. I hope you will. Well, that'll do it for today. Have a great week, and we'll see you again next weekend. Bye-bye.